Hey, what's going on? Eric Cortina here. My next guest needs no introduction. His forum has allowed a lot of shooters to enter into the shooting space. And, uh, of course, his forum is Sniper Side. Uh, Frank, how you doing, Frank? Morning, Eric. How you doing? Excellent, I guess I should say. I'm doing very well. Good. Glad to hear it. So, uh, last time you were here, we talked about how you started Sniper Side. And to this day, it is probably one of those, uh, it's a gateway forum. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it is it's it a, is it, definitely a gateway form it's a it's a way for shooters the the wannabe shooters to meet and interact with uh with others in the shooting community and uh kind of get enough knowledge to uh break through the fear of trying their first match and end up just saying what the hell i'm gonna go shoot a match and then they become shooters well i mean the PRS League started on Sniper's Hide it started in the chat box that we used to have and they developed it on the hide the problem was originally they kind of were doing it and not interacting with everybody and so that's but it did start on snipers hide that league um and and then when i was like you know i was watching them do it and then it was like well when are you going to talk to the people that are actually putting on the matches and doing the things you guys want to do and then they said well, well we'll get around to it and i said well that's not how that works and then they went, well, we're out of here. And, and so, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, it, 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 the, that kind of competition, because Jacob and I were at Rifles Only, we're doing these matches twice a year before there really was any organized matches of any, um, you know, uh, kind of on a repeat mode. There was Storm Mountain, you had Badlands in Oklahoma, uh, TAC, uh, TAC Pro in Texas, and then Rifles Only were really the only places and most of them did one match a year, like a steel match uh, a year, except for rifles only. We did two a year. So that's, it just got popular and popular because I used the forum and the work we were doing at rifles only to promote the kind of the steel sports, I guess is a better way of putting it. Yeah. And I mean, it's took off like, like wildfire, uh, you know, Jacob still holds matches down there, rifles only. That's that was where I shot my first PRS match ever, and uh, yep. he still runs a great course, great match. I we were just down there. I went in February for the brawl. I stopped in there because it was like twenty years for a bunch of us, and it was like you know a reunion of a sorts. But I drove down to rifles only, and and um Laura R rode it, and I took pictures of of most of the competitors and everything. But yeah, I still pop in. And and I shoot the local matches. I just don't shoot them as often. I'm getting old and broken. My eyes don't work as well. And so I don't shoot as many matches unless I'm going to test something. I use them to, to well, because I have a very good local match uh, hour from me. Um, and so I use it as a test bed a lot. I'll go and have something new and say, oh, well, how will this work? And then I go to shoot the local Greeley match. And, and yeah, like I said, I, I go... I'll go shoot a local Saturday afternoon match. It'll be three o'clock in the afternoon. There'll be two stages left. And I'll be like, I'm going home. And then people will be like, what are you doing? There's two stages. Like, yeah, it's three o'clock. I'm going home. <laughs> you know? So I, I do that a lot now. But um, yeah, that's just, that's kind of how it was. We, we started it and we ran it pretty hard. You know, we had the helicopter stages. We had the big run and gun, like eight minute stages that you would run all over rifles only. So um, that's where the uh, the popularity came from was sort of the work we did out of the, out of that area. Yeah, I mean, obviously you had a lot to do with that, and and uh, also, I mean, I know you still teach, you still you're still out there promoting the shooting sports, and I know this because I uh, I have seen you do it. I have sat through a portion of your class at the PRS Expo, which uh, was pretty interesting. I was very amazed at how simple you make it sound I mean it's not that you make it sound you have done it for so long that you have simplified it to the point that it's it's easy yeah and that's my goal that's been my goal I start because I started out working at rifles only we were doing six day classes and a lot of military a lot of law enforcement and a lot of that so it was a big detailed class and my powerpoint my presentation back in that time was like six hours long well, then the, the change that you've seen is, and I love the PR, uh, the Precision Rifle Expo. I think it's a nice event. I, I think it's better for shooters than like the, the I want to go to SHOT Show, 
mentality, you know, for somebody who's not in the industry but wants to go see it, put their hands on, I think that expo's better. And it, it'll get better and better as they grow and, and kind of, you know, the weather helps and things like that because it seems every time we went it was some pretty bad weather. Um, but, which, uh, but, yeah, teaching-wise, I've reduced it down to simplify it. I'm all about simplification and the flow of the class. Like I just had guys, two guys out this weekend. I'm coming up with a new class with Chris Way. And I brought two people in just to look at the flow. And it was like A, B, C, I'm writing that down. Okay, I don't like D, I'm getting rid of that. And that's what brought us to sort of the weaponized math up in Alaska um, through Mark Taylor, you know. And, and what you saw... I did an hour at the Precision Rifle Expo. So I did a fundamental kind of recap. And then I did Gravity Ballistics, which was the weaponized math for us um, back in the, you know, before. for Because weaponized math for us has been around about six, seven years, maybe even a little more. I don't, I'd have to look up the exact date that we did it. But what had happened was after I left Rifles Only, I started teaching and ran into my old platoon sergeant from the Marine Corps at SHOT Show. And he's in the industry in Alaska, and, and he's he has a shop up there for Wiggies Alaska, the cold weather gear. But he's also a hunter, and he's into the shooting community up in, in that Alaska area. So this is like 2014 or so, and he said, hey, you know, nobody comes to Alaska to teach. And you've been teaching at Rifles Only for seven years. Why don't you come up? And we did. And we do two-day classes in Alaska. And since that time, I've done over a 1,000 students just in that state. But one of the problems was the 1,000-yard range that we use was brand new. And they never graded it. So after 600 yards, the ground fell out from under the targets and the biggest problem for us, it was seven, eight, and nine were the problems. And nine was the worst because we had to take it and we had a spot on the ground where 900 yards was marked and we had to drive a pickup truck over that spot. We would put two guys in the bed and hold the target up and then two other guys would pick the legs up to attach the steel to the legs. And then we would drive the pickup truck out from underneath us. And when you're laying down and looking at this target, it looks perfectly level. And there's no ground under it for 13 feet. So spotting, anything you're trying to do, it's hanging in air, and then you can't see the ground under it. So Mark was getting frustrated. He didn't like wasting ammo. And the thing with Alaska, it's not like if I do a class down here, it's going to be 6.5 Creed more, and it's going to be... um. A uh, six millimeter of some variant, and then and that's it, really. You might see one or two three oh eights. When you go up and do a class in Alaska, it's two seventy, thirty odd six, three hundred wind mag, three oh eight, then a six five, then a three hundred wisdom, thirty three, three seventy eight. Guys are coming to class with, so they're bringing the rifle they have. And every single one of them wants us to dope their rifle because they don't have dope. And the biggest thing with Alaska is electronics. So I'll have like the, like Vectronics is coming out with the newest, latest and greatest uh, laser range finder binoculars. And they'll be out next month. So Vectronics has these new binoculars. And through Vectronics, I usually get that stuff early. And I would go to Alaska and have the latest and greatest from them. And those guys will just go, no, nah, we don't want it. Does it work in minus 20? And it's like, I have no clue if it works in minus 20. I'm not going in minus 20. You know, they do. I'm not. And, and so they don't use electronics. So for three classes in, Ju in June and for three classes in July, Mark's like, I want to look at this. And so we started recording every single student's data. And I have 16-person classes in Alaska, and it's pretty much religious. There's 16 people. So three times 16 times two, that's how many, you know, times we're, we're doing that. And over the off-season, Mark takes all that information. You're two, or it's 300 in Alaska. There's no 200-yard line. 
300 yards to 1,000 yard data. And he takes all of that information and he puts it into a spreadsheet. And he starts looking at the numbers. I mean, and, and there's every caliber you can think of mixed in here. So then he puts it and he says, listen, I'm going to call, because what we're doing, we're only shooting to 1,000 yards. I'm going to call 1,000 yards 100%. And he turned the numbers into percentage. And with 1,000 being 100%, every other yard line fell into order. They all matched. So regardless of the caliber, it, it could be something small and light had the same percentage between yard lines as a heavy caliber did. So he calls me up 11 o'clock at night, and he's like, Frank, Frank, I just fell into this. Something's going on. I think I got this. I said, no way, Mark. This is too easy. I said, that can't work. And he's like, no, no, the numbers line up. It's, it matches. Ma and, and for People should understand Mark. Mark's, Mark's a Marine Corps sniper instructor. Mark's a one-shot, one-kill guy. I'll go on a 10-day road trip to do classes with him, and he brings 40 rounds. He shoots his one shot, he hits dead center, and he's done. I did it. What more do you want me to do? It's right there. You know, he doesn't bring ammo like me. I'm bringing 80 rounds with me. You know, he's bringing 40. And, and I'm going to shoot all different. I'm going to shoot that target, that target, that target, that target. I want to look at everything. He shoots once. So we're looking at these numbers and he says, it matches my data. It works for my stuff. And I know my stuff. So we said, all right, we'll try it. We put it on sniper's hide. Nobody could break it. So we start using it in class and we created worksheets because one, I, you know, up in Alaska, nobody has a phone on the line, except that they're going to take a picture of something, but nobody's using software. And down in the lower 48, as soon as you go to a class and you walk in the door, everybody has software. They're ready for you to fill in the numbers, you know? So we didn't want people's head in the phone. We want, we're, we're instructors. We teach, we coach. We're teaching day one people. And, and, and I'm happy to be a day one guy. I did the whiz bang. And so um, from there, we start walking this information and we start doing it in class and it's working. I mean, it's, it's working in Alaska like nobody's business. We've gone from, you know, guys are spending seven, eight rounds at 900 to three rounds at 900 before they're getting on and it's like, wow, this is really working. So we refined it over the years and we called it weaponized math. And one of the things we did, I have a worksheet right here. So we have our gravity ballistics worksheet. I rebranded it since then. So we called it weaponized math forever. Last year, I said to Mark, I said, listen, we're rebranding it because gravity ballistics is too generic. I mean, not gravity, but weaponized math. You go on to Facebook, there's trigonometry pages. There's, this is weaponized math you know, all these different formulas we have. So I said, listen, it's gravity. What we found is we stumbled on gravity. We found the multiplier between yard lines for gravity and it descends, you know, or it, it, it changes, but that's what the number. So if you know, Eric, you have a, a, a percentage, right? So we reduced it to percentage. If it, with a percentage, I have a multiplier. So once I got a percent, now I have a multiplier. And my it, multiplier can move. I don't have to be perfect. This percentage, you know? this percentage is of the wind drift or the elevation or both? The elevation. Okay. It was everything uh, lined up elevation-wise, 300, 400, 500 is all the same percentage. I have the original spreadsheets, and, and we do put it in class at time to show you. But it was like it, – it, like, I think it was like 68% for 900 or maybe that was 800. Maybe it was like 88. Yeah, it was 83% for 900 across the board. It was like 68% for 800 across the board. You know, so these numbers, they were within a percentage point of everybody's data. So once we found that we had it, we had a percentage, we did the multiplier and we called it an X factor. Well, we created this worksheet for our students 
and I'll probably back it up here, be easier. And one of the things we do is 200 is at the bottom and a thousand's at the top. Cause when you're laying down, 200's the closest, just like the range and a thousand's farther away. But we start at 300 yards and let's just say now understand this. Uh, gravity ballistics works in yards or meters. Doesn't matter because you're doing gravity in that distance between that yard or meter. 100 yard or 100 meter doesn't matter. Mills or MOA doesn't matter. Works with mills and it works with MOA. So if you're an MOA guy, it'll work with that. If you're a mill guy, it works with that. Yeah, because it's a percentage, so, right? So it's, if yeah, it's a percentage, it's, well, it's, percentage it's, works with anything. Right, right. right. Frank, we had technical difficulties there, so you're back. So... Yeah, my, my browser doesn't like you, your system or something. You were, telling me, you were telling me about gravity ballistics and how you guys used to call it weaponized math. Yes, yeah, so weaponized math uh, was generic, and we were using it for a bunch of years. And last year, I said to Mark, I said, listen, um, you know, weaponized math is far too generic. People, you go to Facebook pages called trigonometry. that They use that term just for any kind of math formula we shoot with, and there's a ton of math formulas we shoot with. So I rebranded it to Gravity Ballistics over the summer and came out with an app in the fall that we're, we're now having your app store. But the, the Gravity Ballistics, we hand out in class. So that way there, the student is doing their own dope and then they're understanding that dope and how it basically unfolds in front of them and they can visualize it and see it as they're doing some micro simple math. We're talking third grade math at the worst. So, so you know, everything's a percentage. You talk about windage and elevation. Mm -hmm. It's a percentage. So obviously percentage is going to work with any unit of measure, MOA, mills, right. clicks. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Click is not a unit of measure. So, but the point is it's, it's a, it's a percentage. Now, uh, is this, you said a thousand yards is a hundred percent. What's zero? Is it a hundred yards? Yes, you have to zero at a hundred yards. Everything starts from a hundred. So a good example would be 22s. Guys don't zero their 22s at a hundred. There is a gravity ballistic sheet for 22s, but it's all different numbers and modified for a different zero. But the gravity ballistics is designed for any caliber you zero at a hundred yards. And then it's, it becomes that gravity. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a 22 caliber bullet or a 338 caliber. Gravity's going to act on it the same. And so the drop between yard lines is the same. And that's where the gravity ballistics comes into play. It's, it's really super simple math. Like a great example for guys who shoot mills, 300 yards is generally for a lot of people right around one mil, anywhere from 0.8 to 1.3, but one mil is pretty close to your 300 yard dope. If you take that one mil and multiply it by 1.75, that's going to give you a center strike at 400. Now, shooters have a little bit of variation. Your scopes have a little bit of variation. If you're Barrel is very short, under 18 inches, you're going to see it fall off quicker. Like 800 yards isn't going to be perfect in the beginning. You're going to have to chase it a little because you got a short barrel. But if you go to 600, it'll be perfectly fine. So there are some variations. Now, as far as the, the gravity part, we haven't seen maybe 4,000 feet density altitude moves it a little bit. But like in the app, we allow the shooter to adjust the number and I can give you two great examples like why we adjust the number. So we do classes. You talk about me teaching. Two of the classes I do, one is in California in Pala and one is in Pennsylvania in Mifflin. Both of those ranges have angles to them. So we have to adjust the weaponized math X factor number. Uh, like Mifflin has 17 degrees to the thousand yard target. If you were using a uh, Kestrel, you'd have to make sure you put every degree in correctly to get that dope for that shot. With the weaponized math worksheet, we changed the number. And now with gravity ballistics, you can go in and adjust the numbers. And we have it. You can work the number backwards even if you don't know it. If you know I hit the target with that data, then you can play with it until you say, okay, it's not 122 for that. 
it's 118, you know, and, and so you can totally adjust those numbers and we let you adjust the number just in case you run into a situation where your range isn't perfectly flat. So you have to have a hundred yard zero and we recommend a hundred yard zero on everything. Um, I, I don't see any reasons not to have a hundred yard zero today. That's a so. typical question that I see on forums. You know, you, ha- yeah. you, know, you probably see it on sniper side all the time. What distance should I zero my rifle at? You know, it's, it's a, and you tell them a hundred yards and they go, well, it's just a long range rifle. I should zero maybe a 200. No, just a hundred. All it is is a reference point. Right. And well, it's atmospherics come into play. I mean, the thing is, is you don't want to be a guy in Florida, zero your rifle at 200 yards and then travel to high parts of Colorado at 10,000 feet. Cause now your, your 100 yard zero is going to be off. Your 200 yards going to be off. So you, you can't have a longer zero cause now atmosphere is going to start playing with it when you travel at a hundred. You don't have time for atmosphere to mess with it. The other thing, like people say long range scope. Zeroing at two doesn't give you any extra, you know, so if 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 you can zero at 100 and you don't zero at 100, you're not saying, well, my scope only adjusts to a thousand. So if I zero at two, I can go to 1100. That doesn't work, you know, so it, 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 it you have to zero at 100 when you have that 100 capability. I mean, even my ELR guns are zero at 100. I'm going to put a taco unit on it or something if I need to shoot beyond the scope's capability because I don't want to compromise my cheek weld and angle the scopes and raise them up and do anything silly with them. You know, today we have a periscope. Put the periscope on the front and fix the problem. And then that lets a shooter get cheek weld and and not compromise the back of the rifle like that. Yeah, you know, try back, to float through. Back in the day, they used to have these scopes where – yeah they were, the scope was pointing well if you if to in in order to get enough elevation you'd have to point the right. scope at the barrel in order for the barrel not to be in the way they had to raise the scope way up it it was crazy and now with those uh tacom hqs or whatever those things are called those uh yeah periscopes they they it you know i've seen them because they get it to where they can angle it down and then they can angle it around the corner, around the barrel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Pretty crazy. They do have the one around. Crazy. I call them a taco unit. Yeah, I just call them a taco unit because nobody wants to say tacom, you yeah. know, it's like taco unit. Give me a taco unit. <laughs> but no, and, 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 and that was the problem. And I've been the king of two mile a bunch of times. It's down the street from me. I used to go down and film it and take pictures of everybody because normally it would start before I got home from Alaska. So I would come home and then I would be able to catch the finals, you know, cause it's an elimination event. And I would go down and see somebody like David Tubb down there or see Brian Litz or just go talk to some of those guys. But the guys that had the crazy angle don't get a cheek weld, you know? So then they're floating their head behind the scope until they started coming lower or trying to build it up and whatever they do. But for years, there was guys that were shooting and didn't have a cheek weld. And I have photographs of them, you know? So it's, it was there. I just had David, uh, David Tubb on the podcast and we were talking about EOLAR and the scoring system and the selection process. What do you have? What's mm-hmm. your opinion on that? Well, not to hurt anybody's feelings, but I think it's the worst run match we have. Um, I've, I've been to it. I've seen it. I don't like it. The thousands of points you're adding up are ridiculous. Um, you know, it's that plus hit thing, multiply range and all that. And then the draws are really unfair because they, 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 they've now been able to squat like two or so at a time, but they used to only do one at a time. And you know, I, you've shot Raton at the tub range, and that's where they are. As soon as 10 o'clock in the morning hits, your thermals are coming yeah, you're up. done. Right. And they're shooting against the cliff face. So the thermals are riding the cliff face. So you don't, your data is completely shot unless you go and shoot it. And then, you know, for years, guys were, they're not doing it anymore, but they used to go and rent the place for a week, the teams with money. And then, you know, David was one of them and and Litz and those guys, they had $80,000 thermals and they were watching the bullet with the thermals. Mm. 
And so that's how a lot of those teams were doing better till they started outlawing some of the thermals and stuff. But there was ways to game it. But I don't think like King of Two Mile is, is run very well, but it does have prestige to it. And it's the match people want to shoot because it's the original uh, for that. Although there was ones in California, but King of Two Mile basically build themselves as the king. And so, you know, it, it, it has status. Yeah. But I, I don't think it's very well um, uh, executed. So when I sat at the, uh, at the uh, PRS Expo, when I sat there listening to your class, you were – you were talking about mile per hour guns you know what mile per hour mm -hmm. is your gun and to me that was the literally the simplest thing i've ever heard as to how to dope a wind for a gun on the fly can you explain yeah. that to me right quick please absolutely and and we are going to be adding the um craft quick wind to the gravity ballistics app So I'm going to have the wind component and we nailed the, gra uh, the craft quick wind. So a mile per hour gun. If we go back in time to the G1 BC. Okay. We, we modeled G7 in 1943. Okay. We, we're well aware of a G7 model and bullet. It was shot and modeled in the forties, but we used G1 until Brian Litz was born. Why did we use G1 for that long? Because the first number in a G1 BC is your wind drift for that bullet. And in mills, it's very intuitive. In MOA, it, it used to be that a 308 was a 10 mile an hour gun. And the way MOA worked, it said it was a 10 mile an hour gun, which is why every data book you've ever seen has a 10 mile an hour Example in it because that was a 308 in MOA. So today we're using mills. And if you take the first number of your G1 BC, so like a, a good 6.5 Creedmoor is a 0.6 G1. That tells me it's a six mile an hour gun. So it's going to drift 0.6 mills at 600 yards. So six mile an hour wind will drift 0.6 mils at 600 yards. That's a six mile an hour gun. If it was a five mile an hour gun, it would drift 0.5, or it, it would still drink, rather drift 0.6, but it's at five miles an hour. So a 308 is a four mile an hour gun, and you do it that way. So your six, Say you're shooting, what caliber? You shoot like a six mil of yes, some kind, I, don't I you? I'm a 647, 6BR. Let, let's say the 6BR uh, is shooting. It, it, so that's a 647? Well, okay. Well, I have a 6BR as well. My 6BR is an eight mile an hour wind. Or eight okay, mile so an there hour you go. Gun. Eight miles, that's perfect. And that's what I was looking for because you're going to have a faster. So if, if you said to me, Frank, I held .6 on that target and hit it, And I go, okay, I'm going to hold point six and shoot. I missed and you hit it. And I go, well, wait a minute. How come you hit it, but I missed? And it's, well, because it was an eight mile an hour wind. You have an eight mile an hour gun, right? Right. But I have a six mile an hour gun. So you can't tell me point six. You have to tell me eight miles an hour. So if you shoot it and you turn around and go, you shoot and you use point six. But you turn around to me and go, Frank, I hit it at eight miles an hour. I don't care what your hold was, but now I know I have to add two tenths. My hold is actually going to be 0.8 because I have a six mile an hour gun. It's an eight mile an hour wind. Right. I made sparks come up. It read <laughs> me. Um, it's an eight mile an hour wind. So that's two tenths. I'm going to add at 600 yards to equal eight miles an hour. So all of this I can do in my head. And now with Chris, Chris is taking it to a percentage and we can find, so if it's an eight mile an hour wind and I have a six mile an hour gun, that's 1.2% over, right? So I have a new chart here that we're doing for Chris's craft wind. 
And up on this top row here, I would put my mile an hour gun would be one to one, right? So one to one gun, the yard line is my hold. But if it's an eight mile an hour wind, it's an eight over six. And then I can do the percentage and say every yard line I'm going to shoot is going to be 1.2% over the wind. And so then I just slide the decimal point with that. Mm -hmm. So an eight over six, maybe I'm going to hold a one four, right? So I hold a uh, eight and six is 14. Slide the decimal one four. That's my wind hold. I'm going to hold one four. So to clarify or make sure I understand, if I have an eight mile an hour gun, that means mm -hmm. at, eight, at 800 yards, I'm holding 0.8. At 700 yards, I'm holding 0.7. If the wind is yes. full value, eight miles an hour, then Correct. everything lines up 0.3, 0.4, you know, 300 yards, 0.3, 400 yards, 0.4, 500 yards, 0.5, 600.6. And you said after 600, it kind of starts, you got to add it a little more. Well, depending on the caliber. Right. So now it's going to, like a 308 is going to slow down. So seven doesn't go to seven, seven becomes eight. And what happens is your gun becomes a mile an hour slower in that transition. Right. So you can, you can say to yourself, well, at 800 yards, my gun changes to a different mile per hour or a different number. Or you could do that. But in between, between a six mile an hour gun and, and an 11 mile an hour gun, you're adding the tens. At 12, it doubles, right? So anything 12 miles an hour, you're just doubling it. But in between six and 11, You're just adding between one and five tenths to that wind call. So it becomes very intuitive. So based on that, if I'm, if I have an eight mile an hour gun, so at 600 yards, I'm supposed to be holding 0.6, right? Yeah. Let's, at eight miles an hour. Right, correct. Right. So let's just say I shoot and I hit the edge of that target. And I know that I, instead of 0.6, I need 0.8. So that tells me mm -hmm. that the wind is actually two miles an hour faster than what I thought. So it's 10 miles an hour. Yes. Yes. So then I need to be holding. So now some. rethink, right? Rethink your head for 10 and not eight. And we do that all the time. Okay. We'll, we'll be shooting, you know, something across. Like I'll measure the wind at me and I'll measure an eight mile an hour wind. And then when I shoot out at distance and my hold is different, I'll go, Oh, wait a minute. That's 12 out there. Somewhere 12 is picking up my bullet. Maybe it's max ord. Maybe I'm shooting higher. It's off the ground and atmosphere and I'm picking up two miles an hour at max ord, you know, and it's coming back down. So you can't see it necessarily, but the number tells you it's happening. You know, I read it at eight, but I'm hitting it for 10. So I better rethink and it's giving me instant information like, Gravity ballistics is pre-true data. You hit the water line on a target. So I'll explain like shooting gravity ballistics in a minute because it does go into the wind. So we're going to have it where gravity ballistics is you shoot the yard line and you have to have a water line. We're shooting for a point of aim, point of impact. You impact that water line. You write that number down. So maybe it's not one mil at 300. It's 1.1 to hit dead center. Well, then you're multiplying that by the 175. Well, you go to four and it's supposed to be 1.7. Maybe it's 1.8. Well, now you're multiplying that. So you're pre-truing as you're going. With the craft wind as well, you're fixing your wind as you go along because these numbers allow you to see it and know that's no longer eight. That's now 10. And if you're thinking and your head's in the game, you should immediately change what you're doing for 10. You can confirm it. You can check it. But while you're shooting it, the numbers are becoming abundantly clear. So that's one of the main ways of doing that. And like I said, we're going to be coming out with the craft easy wind and it's going to change how people look at doping the wind. You know, it, it used to be People said to you, I'm sure they told you this. Hey, go get a case of ammo and go out and shoot in the wind. <laughs> yeah. With what? What am I starting with? The worm formula? You want me to use the Marine Corps worm formula and run the worm formula in the range and then do the wind that way? I'm never going to learn anything like that. But this way, we're teaching you a method and to use a percentage so I can know 
any yard line I'm going to shoot because the wind's going to become linear, I can go one and a half percent of that yard line, you know, and, and I'm going to be able to do that. And so we're going to have this laid out for you where you're going to learn this quick wind. It's not going to take a case of ammo to learn it. It's going to take a half a case of ammo. And then after that, you won't even see the old wind ways anymore. You're just going to be looking at it and going, it's here, here, and here. I'm done. It, it, it's 25% of the cosine. I need this. It's 50% of the cosine. I need this. It's this speed. That's my wind hold, you know? Yeah, that's very interesting. It's it's just uh, so intuitive. It's 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 yeah. so fast, you know? Well, you, you we, know we lost the everybody. And I, I get it, right? Like, you go to a match. Everybody's walking around with a Kestro in their hand or or some wind reader, wind mm -hmm. reading ability or a, a meter of some kind, which is great, right? I think the first shot you want to try to get us as accurate. You know, I call that, uh, you know, you have relative wind and then you have uh, actual uh Yeah, the effective. We call effective. it the effective Eff for effective us. Wind, right. right. We're calling it the effective wind. And that's the one absolute wind that you have to the first shot is an absolute wind call. Like you have to mm -hmm. you have to use as much knowledge, as much terrain, as much factors as possible to make that first initial impact or even a miss. But you have to correct of that. And once you correct of it, now you just became relative wind reading right because you correct it off right. the previous shot you don't care what the wind is anymore you just know where the first shot missed but the point is when you're doing troop lines and things of that nature if you have to make a call on the fly you know your your wind formula is, is super simple you know and you know i'm i it is i shot rifles only and you 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 know troop lines jacob lo loves them troop lines just yes. walk it out to a thousand walk it back in and When you're moving around, it's it's interesting. It's it's difficult, but you know this. It's super simple. <laughs> well, it, it, and it's it's becoming easier for people to understand. I mean, we're even looking at like there's going to be a way to take your max wind, and we did it this weekend, and it absolutely works really well. Is using this method, you determine what the max potential of the wind is going to be, and we're putting the max wind on the downwind side. And letting it strike, or on the up rather, and then letting it strike in, and then finding your wind call. And what I'll do, Eric, after is I, I run the Kestrel. I'm not necessarily using it because I'm using the quick wind, but after I get a wind call number, and then I say, okay, that hit equals this amount, I go into the Kestrel and I'll readjust my wind for that shot so I can make the Kestrel match up. So I sort of true the Kestrel's wind at the time. So then that way I'm seeing it. So I can say, okay, my, my shot and my quick win method, it, and it's a, we call it the BC method because it's that first number, the G1BC. But the BC method, I'll get my first hit and then I'll work the numbers backwards and go, okay, that's a nine mile an hour wind on this. And I held this for the call, put that into my Kestrel. And then when I go to the next yard lines, I can start working the Kestrel with that kind of known data in it instead of just pulling the wind at me unless it's correct i mean if the wind at me is is on then but if there's terrain or anything and the wind at me is being shielded or it's not perfect then i'm manipulating it yeah so what you're saying is let's say i'm i'm i pull up you know i i measure 12 miles an hour on the castro mm -hmm. at my at my position and then I engage a stage that's, let's just say, zero degrees, straight up ahead, right? Mm -hmm. And the wind is full value, 90 degrees. And I engage, and I find out it's actually 10 miles an hour, right? Yeah. Well, when I go to the next stage, I'm going to use 10 miles an hour, and then I'm simply going to change the angle depending Angles on where it's are right. pointing. Correct. Because we know, now we confirm that it's not 12, it's 10. Use that, yeah. change the angle if there is an angle change, and start with that, and then obviously – Uh, compensate off that because you're not going to be that far off even if you are off you know right. what I mean well and, and part of the thing with like the gravity ballistics and when we do it so people ask me on the gravity ballistics side I it doesn't it does the main yard lines and then I have on the on the uh, range page I have the um, 50 yard 
percentage. And people go, well, how do I get those odd ranges? Well, back in the day, again, if we go back in time and we, and we look at Mills versus MOA, and today people will tell you, well, MOA is finer because it's got the quarter and the eighths and a mill is a third, although there is a, a, an eighth mill for bench rest scopes, but none of us use it. We use the third. So you have a quarter MOA in a third of a mill. So people go, well, MOA is finer. But if you look at the way it's broken up, a mill is 10 tenths, right? So I have 10 tenths to make a mill. And then there's 10 yards per 100 yards. And in the meat of a shot, Every hundred yards is a mill, is how our calibers used to line up. Like if you go between four, five hundred and say six, seven, eight hundred yards, it's about a mill in between the yard lines. It's at a mill, at a mill, at a mill, and you're going to get to the next hundred yard line. Well, how that works is if I have a 440 yard shot, but I only have 400 yard dope, I had four tenths. That's 40 yards. It's 10 yards a tenth. So in mills, it was intuitive. Like with the 6.5 by 55, it was designed to match up to mills. With us, it's 308s. You know, and so now when you go to MOA, that's quarters, right? Four quarters and then 25 yards to 100 yards. It's 25 yards to a minute. So it's 25 is a minute, 50 is two minutes, 75 is three minutes, the next 100-yard line is 4M away. And then our calibers and speeds and powders have a little variation of that. So you can intuitively know, hey, that's 50 yards further, I'm going to add 2M away. You know, that's 25 yards further, I'm going to add 1M away. If I'm in mills and it's 50 yards further, I add 5 tenths. You know, so there's all these ways of doing these things in your head if we go back to what our grandfathers were doing when they did it. And that's the easiest way to look at these numbers. Instead of saying, I need to look at my Kestrel because that's a 560 yard target. My 500 yard dope is 2.5 and I'm going to add six tenths more for 60, three one. That should be my 560 yard dope. And I don't have to think about it. I'm just doing simple math. And that's what's, what you were saying with the gravity ballistics and with our wind is we work to simplify it. And the easiest way we found to simplify it was to go back in time. Yeah. So I downloaded the, the gravity ballistics app and uh, it allows you to put in multiple range cards. So, for right. example, I did one for the place where I shoot the most. Right. Mm-hmm. And. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is like the perfect F glass dope chart because in F glass, we don't care about, we have known distance targets, right? Now, mm-hmm. okay, known distance. I'm going to put that in quotation because we really don't know. They say it's 800 yards. Well, is it or is it 805 or 803? We really don't care. Yeah, right. We have sighters. We're going to hit the target. We're going to center up and then we're going to shoot for score. However, we don't know if it's 801 or 802, 807, whatever. So this app, because we you know we tried apps before, like I, I have tried ballistic apps, and mm-hmm. it may line up perfect at eight hundred, may line up line up perfect at a thousand, but at nine hundred doesn't line up. It may be because that target's not exactly nine hundred. It's just slightly so, off, right? This app of yours allows me to just type in at nine hundred what it actually is. You know, it doesn't have to. Yes. I don't have to change speed, BC, none of that crap. You just type it in, and for me. For F class, this is perfect because, you know, I, yeah, I could I could bring a rangefinder to the to the F class match, to every <laughs> match, and 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 check the actual distance of the target. But the fact that it allows me to change the dope, it's almost like you're doing it on paper. Yeah, and that's it's designed to match our our paper, and so yeah, and and the thing is, is it's it, again we true as we go. If somebody, in great example you just said is Alaska. Two years ago, Alaska put a 700 yard target in for us. They called us over. As soon as we showed up first, you know, class of the season, they're like, Frank, Mark, we just put in new targets. Come look at what we did. And they're like 700 yards right there. We range it. It's 718, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, and for them, it's 700. It's like, okay, that's two tenths more, man. 
that, that, that your dope's off on that. Yeah. In, unless you know. And so I wanted this. And now here's the thing with the Gravity Ballistics app. It's unlimited tracks. You can make as many tracks as you want. You can email the track to yourself to keep it. And, um, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's just that. Si- oh, and it works offline. That was the other thing. It, it, you don't have to be connected to the internet for it to work. So you could be in airplane mode because you're in a place, because a lot of our ranges aren't in places with good cell service. So just put it in airplane mode and you can still work the app and you don't have to be connected to the internet for it to operate. I like it, man. I'm telling you, it's so simple. <laughs> yeah. It's, and when we do the wind, you'll really like Now, one thing to mention is temperature. You have a place here to put temperature and uh, uh, relative uh, density altitude, but they don't actually do they anything. They don't That's do anything. Ref- it's just for reference. Correct. That's just reference. Uh, the app is not using any of that. It's just to say, I mean, like I was out uh, this week, um, this weekend I was out shooting and um, – so it was 32 degrees in the morning and it was 60 degrees in the afternoon. So I was at the targets I shot. I was two and three tenths off in the morning. All right, Frank, we seem to be having some technical difficulties. But one thing I want to ask you before we go is uh, scopes. You know, they have mills and MOA. Somebody who's starting out, you know, back in the day, we all started with like three, three to nine, you know, MOA scope, Mm -hmm. but what about nowadays? What a new shooter, what should they get? Mills for sure. Unless you're shooting F class or like you're doing bench rest and you're doing a bench rest reticle. But I mean, F class is the only reason to shoot MOA anymore because the target is an MOA. Now, um, everything else you should be doing mills. It mainly comes down uh, to communication. Uh, in all my classes, I will only see one MOA scope. Maybe now every other class, we don't see MOA. Most people are using mills. And so the communication aspect, but mills are just so much easier. Base 10 is easy. They're honestly very intuitive. You can think money, 10 pennies and a dime, right? Each click is a penny. Each full mill is a dime. You're going to um 500 yards. It's 25 cents. So it's two dimes and five cents. You know, it's super easy. But I, I think Mills, MOA, the problem with MOA is shooter MOA versus true MOA. Back in the day, they used to tell you this is a shooter MOA scope and it was inches per hundred yard, right? To the, and then true MOA scope, like a night force, is true MOA. So that's a 0.26 MOA adjustment versus a 0.25 inch adjustment. And today they just call everything MOA and that's why a lot of people's software doesn't work right because they think they have MOA and they have shooter MOA or they think they have shooter and they have true. So they bastardized MOA and I'm really not a big fan of it. And it just confuses people. It's fractions, man. Nobody does fractions well. So what about hunters? Nah, they should have be mills. It's so much easier. Uh, it, it's smaller numbers. It, it it's much more intuitive. What you see is what you get, and it's it's a lot smaller. Like the most amiss you're gonna do is point five. It's five tenths. It's like I'm gonna go five tenths more, you know. But it's it's really intuitive, and hunters should be mills. Um, everybody really should be mills, except for like you said, F class or or bench resty people. Yeah, people go well. If you're shooting targets, you got to do this. Well, uh, <laughs> an animal is a target right? Yeah. From shooting PRS, that's when I started shooting mills. And when I started PRS, they said, well, what are you going to start with, MOA? I said, no, everybody's using mills. I'm going to use mills. That's, that's, I'm just going to learn it. And you know, it right. didn't take that long. It's pretty simple. No, it doesn't. And the, the beauty about MOA or not MOA, but mills is, for example, my uh, 6BR, it's like 7.2 mils or 7.4 mm-hmm. at a thousand yards. My 647 is exactly at seven. Uh, I mean, you're dealing with much smaller numbers, whereas yes, easy to remember. You know, you're gonna get there in less than one revolution on most scopes. You know, it's it's right there. Whereas if you're doing MOA, I mean, you know, you gotta say, well, it's like 26 or 27 MOA. I mean, you're sitting there cranking on a dial. You, you most most people lose their place on the dial, especially when they're mm-hmm. under stress. You know, most MOA 
turrets have 10 MOA, you got to dial 25 or 26. You got to go one, two, and seven. Whereas if you're shooting yeah. mills, you just go, you're done. Well, it's, it's like for 400, 1, 8, 500, 2, 5, 300, 3, 4, 400, 4, 5, 5, 6, you know, 6, 8, 7, you know, and, and 7, 6. And so it, it's, yeah, it's such an easy number to remember. And you're only going up like you're going from three to four, from four to five. And it's just your little variation of your decimal place. But you're going from two to three to four to five to six to seven like you said you only have to count from one to seven and and it's really easy to remember but yeah mills are a lot easier the reticles are a little more intuitive um you know you don't have the and manufacturers don't match remember back in the day night force used to have two five seven for the reticle now everybody is two four six eight but you know you if it's not marked you have to look it up and then like i said inch per 100 yard is just a mess yeah well and, and, then and the, nobody likes know, that if, if anything having mills you can use that shortcut wind formula yes the shortcuts in mills are so much easier the wind in mills is easier the elevation in mills and with all this is so much easier and and you know it, it it's a much simpler way of shooting for people um like unless you're doing f class where the target is an MOA target and you can measure it and know what you're doing. Um, otherwise mills, cause then you're going to be talking to people and everybody's talking in mills. Yeah. Another argument that they have is that they, you know, MOA is finer. Yeah. Uh, it's not, it's half a bullet width. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and, and because it is, I mean, it is finer, but how many people can actually hold, like you said, half a bullet width worth of, uh, accuracy? yeah, it's 0.26 point versus 0.36. So you're 0.26 versus 0.36. So you're one tenth of an inch. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that's the difference in that adjustment. But like I said, it, a, a mill can go to 10 yard increments and the MOA, it doesn't usually break down the same, but although everybody hits the same, nobody, nobody doesn't hit a two inch plate. If everybody can hit the two inch plate. Yeah. You're never, you, nobody's ever not dialed and been like, man, I can't dial on that plate. It's too small. I've never, ever, ever heard that happen in my life. Um, you, you know. know, talking about a two inch plate, I, I do the blackjack challenge that KYL mm -hmm. at 500 yards. I watched your moising, not, I watched your iron sight guy. <laughs> and, you know, my goodness, there were so many Marines. I mean, you're a Marine in the comment section talking about how, oh, that's, that's not impressive at all. We used to do it in the Marines with open sights. Yeah, but it was a big target at five. <laughs> uh, that's they, they leave that portion out. They, <laughs> it, 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 it was a 20 by 40 at five. Wow. Well, they didn't, they didn't mention that, but you know, and that, no, no, that's how the whole open sight challenge started. Cause it used to be just a mm -hmm. KYO, you know, or in yeah, yeah. it turned it. It used to be a KYO where if you miss, you lose all your points and start over. Now it turned into a take your limits where hit to move yeah. on because, you know, it, a lot of the yeah, you can't take points no more. The people get upset. Well, you know? oh, you stole my points. <laughs> well, what's happening was a lot of the good shooters they'd always go, regardless of the wind condition, they'd always go for the two inch. And right. then the the timid shooters, they'd stop, and they they right. the timid shooters end up beating the the more confident shooters because they wouldn't go as far. So uh, the challenge turned into that's not, the risk. Yeah. <laughs> so I I said no. I I want everybody to shoot at the two inch. And that's how I, that's why I changed it. But, you know, again, the Marines in the comment section, they were saying, Oh, that's not a big deal. We used to do that all the time. So I said, All right, enough yeah. of that. Enough of the talk. Five grand. And, you can do this with and, open sites. I will give you, <laughs> I will pay you five grand cash. And I've had two guys try it. And, uh, sadly, they couldn't even hit the first one. But, uh, I think they were very limited by their gear. And I think somebody, with a yeah. really good rifle could potentially do pretty good but man that two inch target it's tough it i don't care if you have a scope rifle or a, hell it's tough with a scope rifle much less with open sights mm -hmm. no and i saw that and they were using surplus stuff i mean you'd really have to be in and on with it and those sights aren't super fine adjustment i'd want something that a little bit at least a micrometer sight you know, to try to get in because you got to get that target that small. Well, what's the likelihood? Um, I mean, somebody brings the best, literally like a Ventress rifle. They put open sights on there. What's the likelihood? I don't think that two inch is doable, but they might get lucky. 
Well, they, yeah. I mean, the thing is, they have two minutes and 12 rounds, so they don't have a whole lot of time to get lucky. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've had people with, yeah. with scopes not hit it, you know. With, no, for sure. And I'd have to see what the aperture size. I'm not, I'm not familiar anymore with aperture sizes. So I don't know if they can get an aperture down that small. So they basically just fill it with the target. If they were able to get an aperture that small, they may be able to get away with it. But can you if, see if it? They, You'd have to see the target to center it up. That's a. Right. That's what I, then that's why they just use the aperture when it changes the color. Yeah. If they're on target and, and it fills their aperture. That's why they have different sizes. Yeah. And they can make it fill the target, but I don't know. Like I said, I don't think that's doable two inches at five, yeah. but who knows? Maybe somebody get away. Maybe you'd have to paint it yellow form or orange so they can get a color, at least be able to get the color in the shadow. Yeah. Well, I'll pay. If they hit it, I'll pay. But I Yeah, think no, for sure. I get it. Very, I get it. You know, it's not likely, but it's all fun. Frank. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks for being here. Yes, thank you. Uh, we'll try to get it. I'll figure out why my computers don't work with your system, but <laughs> sure. Um, I appreciate you coming on. And the Gravity Ballistics is in everybody's app store. It's only four ninety nine. I have it. Like I said, it's... unlimited tracks, and then we'll be adding wind to it pretty soon. We got it. I just have to sit down. Um, I was away, and um, this week I got to sit down with them and do the update, but we're going to be updating Good it. Good stuff, man. Frank, All thank righty. you very much. Take care. Thank you. Cheers.